about this. Thank you for being here. So uh, what are we going to learn today? Basically, as we get access to data, um, there's a lot of stakeholders asking us a lot of exciting questions about it. Um, more often than not, they're not very well scoped. And we don't know what we're going to be looking at. We don't know what it's going to look like. So I guess, how do you, how do you scope these requests? And um, that's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so it's about, firstly, scoping a request and a question or a question that, that you have uh, from your stakeholders. Then it's also about finding the right data set. And then after the initial question has been answered, how else can you enhance that analysis? So I guess asking all the follow-up questions. Um, so for the first part, the scoping. What's the three main things that we want to ask? Uh, the first thing being who. So uh, what we want to do here is consider who your end users are going to be. Um, is it someone who is specifically asking about it? Um, how are you planning to present it? Um, who are you presenting it to? Uh, this also helps you define um, what the format of your analysis is going to look like. Do you want it to be a presentation? Do you want it to be like quick email with the numbers? Do you want it to be a live dashboard? Um, have you considered if there's a, a colorblind member on the on the board? And are you accommodating your dashboard or your visualizations to to accommodate for all of these different um, requests? So that's basically trying to answer who this person is or who you're doing the analysis for. Uh, the second thing we want to look at is why you're creating this report. So think about everything about from who's asking it to like why they're asking for it. What are you trying to get from this data? Why is this data important for them? So you have to keep asking why a bunch of more times to be able to um, have, have a fruitful analysis. And then the last question is, what data? So um, then you have to think about where you're going to find this data. So come up with a set of narrow questions um, that can answer this analysis for you. So why do we want to scope a report? Um, the first thing is that maybe the initial question that you receive from the stakeholder is not the best way um, to address the concern that they're talking about. Think about, um, like, if you, if you start to dive into the data too soon, you can get lost into the weeds and lose track of the end goal. Um, and you'll be too focused on learning about the data than to answer the question or, like, what the best way to answer the question is. Um, secondly, maybe the initial questions are not directly answerable with data. And um, it might be, it, the data might be hard to get. So uh, the question could be very subjective. Hard, it can be hard or expensive to even find the data. So that's why it's like super important um, to know, to scope all of these things. And the third thing which I kind of touched upon in the, in the previous slide is adapting to the format and the language of your report. So say you're, per, say you're uh, presenting to the C-level executives and you want your report to be high level, not go too much into like a certain product. But if you're talking to a product manager, then you want it to be super in depth, talk about the different technicalities. Uh, the other thing that you want to adjust for is, as I said earlier, like if somebody's colorblind, if someone has um, accessibility issues, technical issues, like you want to make sure that the analysis that you're doing and the end product that you're producing have to be in line, uh, which is usable and digestible by your, by your st stakeholders. Um, so for the next part, Megan's going to take over. All right. So I'm going to talk about the finding data component of this, because you can have a really interesting question to answer. But if you don't have data that you can use to answer it, like you're going to go nowhere. Um, so you just need to find some sort of data to match that. So to start out really simply, just choosing a table. I'm sure there's plenty of sessions here that have covered lots of different types of data sets and different open data platforms that you can use from you know, New York City's open data platform is obviously the main one people here are talking about. Um, but like New York State has them. Other cities have them. There's a, a place called uh, data.world that has a lot of open data sets where sometimes like 538 will publish their data sets to that platform. So a lot of places you can look and just same thing you would do with Google, like search a keyword that seems relevant to what you're interested in. Um, but once you start to get some results, you need to sort of suss out like 
which ones are actually good to use. Um, so you can learn a lot more about this in a Discovering Open Data class if you haven't already attended one this week. But a couple things to look for. One, you want to see that your data is trusted and that like this is a valid data set and it's not going to have a bunch of data quality issues. On the New York City Open Data Platform, one way to do that is you can see the total number of views that are associated with the data set. So if a lot of other people are looking at and using this data set, it's probably fairly trustworthy. So that can be one good thing to look for. And then another thing is recency. Like you often don't want to be analyzing stuff that happened 10 years ago. Like you want to know what's going on in your community today. So you want to also check this like updated date and just make sure that this data is updated frequently. Um, so a couple of things to look for there. And then if you're not quite sure like what keywords to search, there's also a page where you could look by agency, like all the agencies are listed out. And you can just look at an individual agency and see all the data sets they have available. So choosing a, a particular table can go a lot of ways. We won't spend a whole hour on that. Um, but what happens when you can't find the table or column you want? Sometimes it's easy. You search 311, and the top results at the top of the uh, list in the open data platform is 311 requests since like 2010 or something like that. Like, OK, you got what you wanted. Um, but a lot of times, it's not always that easy. So how can you sort of work around it when you're not able to find what you want? Uh, so one thing could be just finding like a similar metric that will have similar behaviors, even if it's not exactly what you wanted. So maybe you're interested in like foot traffic, like how many people are in Midtown during the workday. And maybe you've seen some of these charts where people show like how the population in Midtown sort of surges in the middle of the day when everybody's coming in for work and then it decreases because nobody actually lives there uh, in the evenings. So if you wanted to do something like that, like Foot traffic data does exist. Obviously, Google has it. And you'll see in Google that it has like the popularity charts about businesses of like, when are people going to this business? Like, There are companies that have that data, but that data is valuable to them. So they're not going to give it to you for free, usually. Um, so you would often have to pay for some sort of like actual foot traffic data. Um, but what we do have available through public data sets is like turnstile data for the MTA. So you can't know exactly how many people were in the area. But you can know this many people exited the turnstile that was close to that business. Um, so I mean, it depends on what resources you have available to you. If you have an unlimited budget, sure, go ahead and buy the good data. But a lot of times, a lot of us are sort of like citizen analysts, and we don't want to spend our own money to acquire data. Uh, so there are, there are open parallels to more expensive data sets. Uh, the second point here is just to filter larger data sets. So you've probably heard a lot about 311 data today. It was brought up in like the intro session. That's a data set that touches so many different agencies. It has the rat reports that sanitation handles. Uh, it has like complaints that are addressed to like the NYPD, uh, construction complaints that go to the Department of Buildings. Like it encompasses so many different agencies in one place. So if you're not finding something that's really specific to the agency that you're looking for or the data that you're looking for, sometimes those big data sets can be a great resource to just go there and try to filter that data set down to what, what might be helpful for you. And then the last point here is just combining multiple data sets. Unfortunately, this is not easy in the New York City open data platform. But if you work with tools like Python or SQL, like you can import these data sets and, and join them together. Or even in Excel, if your data set is small enough, you can just download two tables and then use like VLOOKUPs and index matches to join things together. Yeah, I think like one thing you could think of is when you have some data, you might want to think in terms of like per capita. Like if you're looking at 311 complaints, there's going to be more complaints if there are more people in the area, usually, because there's more options for who could be submitting the complaints. So maybe that's something you want to combine with like census data, where you can see in this neighborhood this many uh, complaints were submitted. But that neighborhood also has a really big population. So like as a per capita number, like maybe it's really not that bad compared to other neighborhoods. So joining multiple data sets like that can give you a lot more insight into the trend. Improvise, adapt, overcome. All right. Now we have to do a quick costume change. Um, so hello again. Um, um, my name's David, and I'm a real estate agent in New York City for the last 15 years. I help people find houses in this beautiful concrete jungle. And I'm Karen. Uh, 
I'm Karen. I live in Florida, uh, and I'm looking at moving to New York. So I have I have a lot of questions for Div about how I find the right place to live. Okay, let's get into it. My first question is, which public high school is the best? Hmm, interesting. It looks like you've graduated high school, so why is this data important to you? Well, I actually have a, a son who's in high school right now. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, why do you think, um, why, why, do you, why are you looking for the best high school? Well, he's doing really poorly in his high school in Florida right now. He's really skipping class a lot and spending a lot of time in the swamps with the alligators. So I just want to make sure that he graduates. That's, that's very fair. OK, I'll uh, get back to you on that. So I'm back at my office, crunching some things. So first, who is the requester in this case? Um, the requester is a mom of a high schooler. Why do you? Why does she need? Um, why does she need this data, or why is she asking the question? Because uh, her child needs guidance to make sure they graduate. And um, where can I find this data, or what data should I be looking at? Maybe graduation rates is a is a good place to start. So let's get crunching. Um, so. Yeah, maybe maybe a good way to frame this question is like we can say we we can see that what high school is best is a very vague question. There's a lot of attributes to it. It depends on your area. It depends on your zip code. It depends on how close it is to you. So there's a lot of different factors. So just vaguely asking what is the best high school in New York City is not good enough. So how can I boil down to this? So maybe what I can do is. Let's let, let let me start by looking at the high school which has the best graduation rates. Maybe that's that's a good start, and then accordingly, I can help Karen look for an apartment in that zip code. Maybe. Okay. So after crunching all the numbers, <laughs> yeah, we should turn the bubble. Uh, but yeah, uh, looks like Bronx Health Sciences boasts a hundred percent graduation rate. So that's amazing. All right, thanks for that data. Uh, I have another question. Does the police department respond quickly? That is very fishy. Why would you need to know uh, if the police department responds quickly? Well, right now I have a lot of space to myself and it's pretty quiet. I know New York is a little more packed and I, I just assume my neighbors are going to be noisy and I'm going to want to call the cops to help them shut that noise down. OK, Karen. Uh, <laughs> Does it matter if the police are fast? Well, I'm actually about to have another baby, and I really want them to get a good night's sleep, so I need the, the noise to stop as soon as possible so that the, the baby can get enough rest and let its brain develop so that it doesn't become a delinquent in high school. That is very fair. OK, I'll get right to it. So I'm back at my office now. What is the question being asked right now? Does the police department respond quickly? Um, who is asking this question? Uh, it's it's a lady who is, uh, the requester is a future resident of New York City. So it's the same person, but now the attribute changes a little bit. Now it's no longer a person who's looking for a high school for the kid, but it's, also, it's about a future resident who's worried about uh, a newborn that's coming to um, her family soon. Why is this important? Because um, she's concerned about the noise issues. So maybe that's something that um, I should consider when I'm showing her apartments. And what data should I look at? Um, one of Open, uh, OpenNYC's favorite data set, the 311, might be a good place to start looking. But can I, instead of looking at the police complaints or how quickly the police respond, can I just find her a house or move her far away from the noise so that there's fewer complaints to begin with? So what's, what's, what would help me in this case? I would just look at what department has the least residential noise complaints rather than looking at response time for cops. So that's how uh, we would reframe the question. And after crunching the numbers, here's what we see. that. Um, she may be in, uh, you, you may you may be interested in the quieter neighborhoods, maybe in Staten Island or or Queens, 
looks like all of these blue and purple areas um, are a good place to start looking. All right, well, thank you so much for that information. I think Staten Island is gonna be a great fit for my whole vibe. Uh, all right. Where'd Karen go? Uh, so the next part of this is follow-up questions. So hopefully that little skit just made things a, a little more concrete in terms of how somebody can come up with a bad question in the first place, or not a bad question, just not a well-scoped question and what you can do to have the conversation to get that to a point where it can be answered with data. Because if you're asking things like, what is the best? Like, there are a lot of ways to measure best for a lot of things. Uh, so that's, hopefully that makes that piece more concrete. Then the next thing is you come back and you have these data points to answer that initial well-scoped question, but sometimes more questions arise based on the data that you find. Um, so one thing that might come up is you see some sort of an anomalous behavior and you might want to understand like what's causing that anomaly because it can affect how you interpret the data and like do you think this trend is going to continue? Is there a data quality issue in your data? Um, so here's an example of a chart. I, I obscured the x-axis, but this is annual flights into LaGuardia. Does anybody know what happened in the middle here? COVID, <laughs> yes. Uh, so you can see obviously enormous decrease in the number of flights that were arriving to LaGuardia because people just weren't traveling as much. And so a bunch of flights were, were canceled or not scheduled. Um, so you can see some anomalies like that in the data. And a lot of the time you'll be able to tie it to something that you've personally experienced or something that was a headline in the news uh, and just understanding where that trend is coming from. So based on the idea that we know that this is from COVID, we can hope that it's not going to impact the trend in the future. We can see that flights recovered in the following years. And then unless we have another pandemic, things are generally going to be pretty stable going forward. So we know that like that shouldn't impact our interpretation of this data too much. Some other follow-up questions you can ask. So you might want to see the data segmented by different agencies or neighborhoods and just looking at uh, different ways to break out the data. So you might have like an initial statistic and then you just want to compare. So you say like, I have a number, I have a hundred complaints about rats. Like, is that high or low? Like I have no context for that. Uh, so comparing across agencies or neighborhoods can give you some something to compare against and understand the relevance of your numbers. And then one last thing you can do is if you initially looked at one aggregate number, like you might want to see trends potentially over time. Um, so looking at, I mean, to bring up rat complaints again, like that's something that's constantly evolving. Obviously, the city's making a lot of efforts to drive down the number of rats in the city. So if you looked at a span of five years, like that's not going to be a very good representation because there's been so many more efforts implemented in like the last year. So seeing those trends over time can also help you get more understanding of what's going on in your data. All right, so that's the presentation. Uh, now we're gonna give everybody a chance to think about how to ask good questions of data. So we have three personas. Uh, Div, do you wanna like find some places in the room for these to go? Yep. So Div's gonna place these personas somewhere around the room. Um, we have expecting parents, an entrepreneur who's starting a pet store. So pet store is on that wall. Uh, I think that one is a realtor on that wall. So if you, you wanna take the role of the realtor or a potential pet store owner, and then on the back wall is gonna be expecting parents. So these are three personas. You can put yourself in the shoes of these people. And then we have three data sets that you have to work with. So pretend there's no other data that exists in the entire world. This is all the data that exists. We know about dog licenses. So like the names of dogs, the zip codes where they live, uh, when they were born. We know about popular baby names in the city. So the first name, the year they were born and the number of them. And then we know about parks. So we have the name of the park, number of acres in the park, and then category would be like, is it a pier? Is it a playground? those kind of things. So those are the data sets that you have to work with. So the challenge to you all is come up here, grab a sticky note and a pen, write a question that you think you could answer with these data sets that would be relevant for those personas, and just go stick it on the wall. 
And if you see that somebody else had a question and you have an interesting follow-up question, feel free to like stick your sticky note to like the bottom of theirs. And yeah, ask as many questions. All right, I think, I think we're ready to go around and check some of these out. All right, we've got a lot of pet store ideas here. So what is the time that it took for a dog to be licensed or registered? Um, so anyone wanna kind of build on that? Like why would a pet store care about dog, like how fast dogs are licensed? Any thoughts? Diff? Why would a pet store care about how fast dogs are licensed? Maybe talks about mm, how up to date in a way, how how quickly, how how much they're you yeah. belong. <laughs> and yeah, maybe maybe it's about like who are the responsible pet owners? Like if yeah. you if you get your dog licensed quickly after they're born, like you're on top of things and you're gonna buy a lot of shoes for your dog. Uh, <laughs> What's the most popular breed of dog in New York? Uh, why would pet store care about that? Yep, that's a that's a great question to ask. Um, it's interesting because now, if I'm uh, as a pet owner, if I'm gonna order some merchandise, if I'm gonna be stocking inventory, then I want to know what the most popular breed is. Uh, kind of adding on to that, maybe I would also like to see how. Um, a, breed of a dog has been getting popular over time or reducing in popularity. Maybe another thing that we can look at is zip codes. When what area are they more popular? Then I can think about opening my store there. Or if my store is there, then I can think about buying those merchandise. So that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so we have which area in New York has the most dogs. So if you're trying to pick the location, like you haven't already settled on where you're going to like position your pet store yet. You might want to be somewhere that's already close to a lot of dogs so they don't have to come to you. Um, in what neighborhood is dog ownership increasing most rapidly? So getting ahead of the trend. I think Div and I had talked about this when we were preparing preparing as well, just sort of seeing like uh, indicators of like gentrification of an area. <laughs> uh, what is the smallest breed that's easily trainable? So if you are trying to sell dogs, like you want to have some talking points about those dogs. Um, I think that one, I don't think we have enough data about how dog breeds behave. So we would need another data set that would be something related to like dog behaviors. Um, so we would have to find that. Um, but maybe the kennel club or something has, has something like that. Uh, types of dog supplies that you should carry based on the age of the dog. So like different ages of dogs require different types of foods that could help you decide what kind of kibble to get. Uh, which park has the most acres and is it close to the pet shop location? Um, so that could be good of like advertising and just getting in front of your customers are probably taking their dogs to parks. Uh, how many dog license were, licenses were issued in the past year so you can get a sense of like demand. Uh, how many parks are in the zip code uh, or is there a designated dog park? So if, if one of our categories was dog parks, like. For some of these other questions that are about parks and like how large are the parks, it might also be relevant if they're targeting dogs specifically or if it's like a playground, there's probably not gonna be as many dogs hanging out there. So some good questions for pet store owners if anybody is feeling inspired to open a business after this. Uh, <laughs> do you wanna go through the realtor ones? Yeah, sure. Um, so, okay, for the realtor ones. Which zip code contains the largest parks named after US presidents? Hmm. That is an interesting one, but would someone elaborate a little more as to why we think that's important? The client's a history buff. <laughs> hmm. So that's a good, yeah. So it's good to keep in mind um, about that. Also, if someone is named after, I don't know if someone names, named John comes in, then it's a good sell. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I want to live by a park with space to run at. That is great. Um, so I'll be looking at like the acres part of the park's data. Yep, the acres and what zip code it's in. Need to find a house where there aren't too many dogs since I'm allergic. That's a great question because I would expect a realtor to have all of these answers. Um, and if there are too many dogs in the area, 
then I don't want to be there. Also, um, with respect to that, we can also look at the number of dogs, the number of parks, maybe to some density and see how many dogs are actually going to that park if it's more dogs or more humans. Um, what parks with playgrounds are currently in Harlem? Hmm. So for this one, maybe we can club it a little bit with doing with, um, yeah, so how many parks are in an area where you want to live? What types of retail businesses would be best suited for the neighborhood? That's a good one. For retail businesses, um, so it would kind of go, because we only have dog licenses and baby names, maybe we can open a baby store or a toy store, <laughs> a toy store or a, or a pet store. So that's good, maybe we can look at, but we don't have zip code data in that one. So we can just see uh, how many babies were born in a, in a particular year. Um, so I would say that we do not have a lot of information about the retail businesses other than clubbing it with the dog licenses and then going back to the pet store business. Um, so this one similar to the one we went through before, how many acres in the nearest park? I run marathons every year, so it's important for you to have that information. How many dogs were born this year? Do we need more dog-friendly units? Nice, yeah. So again, going back, looking at the zip code, looking at how many dogs were born in a certain area, and then how many, if it's increasing over time, decreasing over time, um, does that mean if you have, if, if it's a dog-friendly neighborhood, does that mean I need bigger houses? Are people are gonna want, to, like, do, do people want two bedrooms instead of a studio? Yes. Can I speak to this one? Yeah. Can I wrote that one? I specifically, like when I'm looking for an apartment, sometimes it'll say like, no dogs allowed. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by like dog friendly units. Like if they're seeing, yeah, lots of dogs in a neighborhood, um, maybe for the benefit of like the realty company, they should get more like dog friendly units in their mm -hmm. portfolio. Something. Right. That makes sense, and uh, adding on to it, maybe find apartments with like dog-friendly amenities and whatnot, have a pet store nearby, um, also bigger houses, a lot of, lot of um, advantage to this question. Do dog owners tend to live near parks? Hmm. So yes, adding on to the previous question is, is it that people with dogs prefer to live closer to a park how many parks in a zip code? Is that is that um, a factor while making a decision to buy a, or a rent house? How far is the nearest park? Kind of went through over to that. Which zip code have the most dogs? We did talk about that. This one's about lovers and haters both, so <laughs> that's important. Um, what neighborhoods are family friendly? So some of these questions can be clubbed about like how in a in a particular zip code. How many dogs do we have, and um, how can I, as a realtor, sell to these dog lovers or people who do not prefer pets? And the the family friendly one, I would say that maybe to answer that more concretely with the data we have available, like we have playground information, you can filter like the parks for playground categories. Uh, so our last category over here is the expecting parents. So what is the highest count of births at local hospitals? Unfortunately, in this universe, we do not have that data. We just have the total number of births across the whole city, not broken out by hospital level. Um, and then what are the most popular baby names? If you want your kid's name to be unique, like trying to find like what is the least frequently used baby name could be something. You want to be an influencer and have a really catchy name. Uh, what will my son's future wife likely be named? if you want to prepare him and just leave little hints through his whole life. Um, but I guess he would see that in his classmates. Um, or what makes for a nice neighborhood? Um, so if, if the parent's considering moving to be somewhere that's better for their kid, so that sort of has a lot of overlap with the, the realtors, like do they have a lot of dog runs or, or water access? Uh, somebody wants three-syllable baby names, so you could look at if you want your kid to have a really long, fancy name, you could look at the character length of each name that's in that data set and find the longest one and see if that inspires you. 
uh, most common names for babies in the last 10 years. If you want to avoid them, especially if some of them indicate that somebody's a little bit older, maybe you don't want your kid to have an old name. Uh, how many Rachels have been born since 2010? Maybe somebody's a Friends fan. Um, what's the least common name in 2024? Yeah, uh, it's another unique name. Uh, and then the last one here is most common name by gender every year. So you can see if maybe there's some some swap over like the name Harley or something like that. Like used to be a male name, now it's becoming more female, and you can kind of see see the transitions there. So all interesting. Uh, one that Div and I came up with, combining a couple of the data sets together, because remember, you're not limited to just looking at these in isolation, is what if I want to name my kids something that's not going to be interpreted as a dog name? Um, so do you have the query for that? So we did, we did write up that query just because uh, we thought it would be interesting. Um, yeah, so we, we have the list of, do you want to scroll down to the results? So we took the number of babies in a single year with a given name and the number of dogs in a single year with that given name and then just joined those things together. And then we just divided like dogs to babies ratio. Uh, so the name Lola, very skewed towards dogs, 270 something dogs named Lola and only like 14 babies that are humans. Uh, Matthew, very human name, so congratulations to any Matthews in the room. Uh, you're definitely not a dog. So yeah, that, that was one we thought would be fun. Maybe parents don't really care about that, but you know why your kid made fun of for having a dog's name? You're not going to name your kid Rover. <laughs> Although that's not appearing at the top of this data set, oddly. Um, all right, I think that's all we've got. Thank you guys all for participating and giving us some some good questions to work with here. And yeah, and we'll we'll be around the rest of the day if you want to chat. Thank you. What was the name which was most common between the two? The most common. I think Lola. No, Lola. Well, Lola is the. Like, it's one of the most common dog names. Dog name, but not, I mean, which was equal 50%. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> filter that down. There were, there were more, more babies than dogs or dog names. I think there are more babies. I would say medium, medium name. Because also, so this is a dog <laughs> licensing data set. And from what I understand from talking to people who own dogs, they don't know that they have to get their dogs licensed. So I think yeah. there are a lot of like unreported dogs yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna be skewed towards the babies anyway. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a question more about like ethics and question of, of interrogating data so like do you get i mean i know this session was more about like how do you scope questions to begin with or problems to solve but like how about dealing with questions that are very ethically not appropriate or like how do you even go about that and I'm, like if, if someone asks it to you, like if you're a data person, or like if you're yeah. the one coming up with the question. I mean, I, 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 feel, I feel like yeah, in like realtor good. stuff, like this stuff comes up all the time. Like demographics, yeah. like how do you, like, is that also, I, I understand from a, from a realtor side, they can't actually tell you about crime data. Like they can only point you to data sources, they cannot like yeah. say, yeah, I think there are a lot of like rules with like the realtor association of like what they're allowed to tell you in order to prevent bias, um, and I think even like disclosing like your family status or whatever is sort of a form. So like I guess different organizations for different careers would have their own regulations, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer the ethics question. It really depends on like. A, a lot of legal implications also. Yeah, I guess for every yeah, for every occupation or like pretty much any of these like agencies, they have all of these like different laws where they can share certain information or not. So uh, I think there's there's 
quite many card rails around that. Yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to you're the person pulling the data and your personal sense of ethics. And like, I mean, we can definitely advise on language for like pushing back on people and telling them that you're not going to answer something. But I, I don't think Div and I are qualified to tell you what, what is the ethical way to prevent mm -hmm. data. <laughs> we work at a private company. Good.